O'Neill in uh, 1998, and I was sharing with some folks today, that was right at the time when we had finished a community-wide process uh, related to our master plan policies. And the person who was the mayor at that time was also an urban planner. So I was very excited about all the cutting edge planning that was going on in San Antonio. What happened, unfortunately, was that although a lot of work went into creating the master plan policies, it wasn't something that was often referred to in relation to key decisions and development that went on in our community. And so here we are in 2014, and we're about to embark on a comprehensive planning process here in San Antonio. And my, my hope, my deepest hope and desire is that the plan will be the people's plan. And so toward that end, we have invited uh, some special guests to, to come in and share with us their experience from Philadelphia on how they uh, engage the broader community in a comprehensive plan for the city of Philadelphia. And we certainly hope to, to learn. And we've had an opportunity to share throughout the day. And I think we've, we've shared about our experience as well. But again, I'd like to uh, thank everyone who helped to uh, put this event together and make today possible. I'd like to thank our guests who are probably tired. They've been uh, meeting with, they went to the mayor's state of the city address and they've had breakfast with several of our key stakeholder groups. And now they're here this evening to share uh, why we should care about the comprehensive plan and to talk about what they did in Philadelphia. So I'm so excited. I'll go ahead and bring up our first presenter, who's Mr. Sean McCainy. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman, and thanks again to the AIA chapter, the university, and the River Authority for inviting us down. I've been saying all day, I can't tell you how excited we are to be in San Antonio, coming from the third snowiest winter in Philadelphia's history. <laughs> I was joking earlier that we've got new words in our, in our vocabulary. I want you to listen to this. Have you heard of a snow gym, a, uh, a shovel gym? Well, we're just happy to wake up and not have to shovel out a driveway. So. Um, we're going to talk tonight about our experience uh, trying to promote uh, more civic engagement around uh, comprehensive planning in Philadelphia. But I want to say right from the beginning that, you know, we expect to learn just as much from San Antonio as maybe you'll learn from us. Uh, but as a cynical, jaded Philadelphian, I reserve the right to, to maintain that we have it harder. <laughs> right? Our, our, our problems are more severe. We face deeper challenges. San Antonians are smarter. They're more sophisticated. They're better looking. Um, but, but the point. But seriously, seriously, just aside, I would say that um, we did have problems uh, trying to engage people, trying to re-engage uh, folks in planning in Philadelphia, and and our goal is even more fundamental. We're going to talk about a specific public policy intervention, but our goal as a foundation that I represent was really it was about restoring public confidence in public processes, restoring people's belief that Philadelphia had a future after many decades of decline, and that cities with futures plan for them. So uh, just, to get, just to give you a little overview of what we're going to talk about, I'm going to explain why uh, the William Penn Foundation, which is the largest private foundation in Philadelphia, was interested in promoting uh, civic engagement and comprehensive planning. Harris Steinberg, my colleague from Penn Praxis, is going to talk about a specific uh, public policy project that we funded to model a new process for civic engagement. And then my colleague City, uh, Donna Carney from the Philadelphia City Planning Commission is going to talk about uh, the Citizens Planning Institute, which is how we're institutionalizing civic engagement in Philadelphia. So you can sort of see our work as a sequence of events. The foundation helped initiate public planning pr process. Uh, Harris's group uh, created a model to demonstrate how it would work, and today uh, Donna is continuing the work by running the uh, Planning Institute. But to begin with, um, I'm going to give you a compressed history of Philadelphia. When you leave the room tonight, you'll all be experts on Philadelphia's history, and it's really easy. Okay, there's only three three things we're going to talk about tonight. Okay, so 1776, right? <laughs> Those guys in wigs go in that building and spend the summer sweating through their silk stockings and invent the United States of America. <laughs> and by, the, a byproduct is they give the world modern democracy. Uh, afterwards, they go out, they party, they ring the bell too hard, they break it. Um, 
Flash forward to 1876, and 10 million people come to Philadelphia for the, for the, to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the nation. Now, this was a time when only 40 million people were in the entire country. People came from all over the world to go to this, to marvel at the new technologies that were available at the time. Alexander Graham Bell's telephone was introduced at the Centennial Exposition. Um, what, but the effect of the exposition really was it changed the perception of the United States from being a rural agricultural backwater to an emerging industrial giant. And Philadelphia played a big part of that. Philadelphia itself was becoming a huge industrial city. Uh, and it really would become one of the, the, what we like to call the workshop of the world, an arsenal of democracy. For 100 years, Philadelphia was a huge, important manufacturing center. We built everything from Stetson hats to Baldwin locomotives. 100,000 people worked just in textiles in Philadelphia at the peak of the industry. Um, okay, now the only, the, the other third event or the major milestone you need to know about is the movie, right? <laughs> uh, so flash forward another 100 years and the, Rocky uh, wins Academy Award for Best Picture. I, I'd forgotten. I was a kid when this movie came. I was too young even to see it in a movie theater. Sylvester Stallone was the star, but Philadelphia played a really major role in this film. It really was the backdrop of the film. And looking back now, uh, you know, Harris and I are natives of the city. Boy, it was grim. I mean, Philadelphia in the 70s really was showing its age. It was really a period of post-industrial decline, deterioration, and you know, you, we just marvel at how different the city is today. But in 1976, uh, the city had really had experienced at least two, two decades of industri industrial dis disinvestment. Flash forward another 10 years, and this is really the low point of Philadelphia's modern history. The city of firsts, the first hospital, the first university, the first computer, was the first city in America to bomb itself. We literally, a police helicopter literally dropped a satchel bomb on the rooftop bunker of a back to nature militant extremist group and burned down an entire neighborhood. 65 homes burned, 11 people were killed. And this was the images of Philadelphia throughout the world. Every TV, uh, every national news broadcast covered it. It was around the world that, um, you know, this was what people saw of Philadelphia. And it really, uh, it really is emblematic of, of how things felt like then, out of control, that, that there was a, a lack of strong leadership and civic vision. Um, but, but eventually, things began to change. In the very early 90s, a whole series of factors, national trends, local trends, local events, began to reshape the future of Philadelphia. We elected a very different kind of mayor in 1991, Ed Rendell, who, unlike any mayor before him, would open the city's swimming pools by jumping in with kids. He went on to become governor, a less successful chairman of the Democratic National Committee. <laughs> But, but really by dint of his personality, he was a, a tireless promoter of Philadelphia. And he reinvented, the first thing he did is reinvented our tourism economy. So what was an industry about school buses coming for a quick trip to see the Liberty Bell turned into, uh, made Philadelphia into a, really a national destination for heritage tourism. Another event that happened around the same time was that Philadelphia established the Center City District, which is now an international model for business improvement districts. We basically started cleaning the place up. I mean, really hosing the streets, cleaning the streets, making them feel safer. Um, major investments in streetscape and just the public improving the public realm. It really, really was one of the seminal uh, milestones for the for the revitalization of Center City. And our economy changed. So in 1970, 189,000 people worked in manufacturing in Philadelphia. In 2010. 184,000 people worked in healthcare and education. This image is just the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. This is not the entire campus. This is just the medical campus. So this huge investment in eds and meds really, really completed the shift of our economy from a manufacturing industrial economy to one that was focused on services. And flash forward now, uh, Center City, uh, uh, that today is, has sort of risen from the ashes of the move incident of 1983. I mean, Philadelphia now has the third largest downtown population in, in America, behind only New York and, and uh, 
uh, Chicago. And in, in, folks who live in downtown enjoy a first class, a first world existence. I mean, great parks, culture, uh, outdoor dining. It's just an amazing, amazing uh, transformation of the city over the last uh, couple of decades. I, I um, was just saying to someone earlier, I, we had colleagues in from Cleveland, and it was a Tuesday night. We were walking around downtown. It was full of people, and they said to us, why are always people out? Like, is, there, is there some kind of special event? I mean, is there? And now it's just Tuesday night in downtown. Um, so Center City used to be this. This is what, what was traditionally defined as downtown, this neat, tidy box of two square miles between the two rivers. But effectively, we now talk about greater Center City. Uh, 200,000 people now live in the zones that are identified here. And what's happening is the two uh, local economies of downtown and the, and the university district are now basically merged into one single economy. And it's pushing in all directions. Uh, the, uh, the, the effect is that it is real, the, 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 uh, the, the city's downtown has become really a 24-7 uh, downtown. So uh, all of this change, um, in 1997, the city passed a, a, a 10 year tax abatement, which uh, triggered a building boom in downtown. 12,000 condominiums were built between 1997 and uh, 2007. Uh, the, the national trends, the real estate bubble, of the early part of the, the 2000s, the tax abatement, uh, in, you know, folks, uh, empty nesters moving to the city was really pushing a, a huge bubble of development through the city. And it began to concern us as a, a key stakeholder about what, you know, the, the potential that we would squander a huge opportunity. Um, essentially, all those years of decline, uh, we had lost uh, all of our planning, development, and regulatory infrastructure. Uh, our, we hadn't adopted a comprehensive plan in 50 years. Our zoning code was hopelessly out of date. Our planning commission was marginalized. Our mayor and uh, city council had no interest in planning, yet all this development was happening. And it was becoming alarming, again, that uh, a lot of it was happening in an ad, ad hoc, uncoordinated way. And of particular concern to us, it was the Delaware Riverfront, which we consider the city's single most valuable redevelopment asset. And within the zone of the riverfront, uh, at two, in 2005, we uh, conducted a study and learned that 10,000 additional condominiums were in the pipeline for the riverfront. Uh, two cas casinos were planned, and Harris will talk about that in a moment, and 5,000 parking spaces. And the, 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 well, the challenge we saw was that um, you know, it was all happening without any kind of plan or strategic framework. And our concern was that if, 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 if there wasn't a, a stronger framework for land use and zoning, that it wouldn't add up to the world-class waterfront we wanted. We were very careful observers of our neighbor to the north, New York, and, had, and studied Battery Park City as a, as a, as a key model, and recognized that the, the real estate deals, the individual building that occurred in Battery Park City, you know, made Battery Park City a reality. But it was the plan that went before, the strategic framework that Battery Park City Corporation created that, created the, that made it excellent, that created the, that extra increment of value. The public realm that New Yorkers enjoy was all part of that planning process. So, our, so we felt that a plan was, was necessary and uh, engaged Penn Praxis to help lead an effort to rethink the Delaware River waterfront to ensure that public access, there's no public access currently on the industrial part of the river, that public access would become the organizing principle for redevelopment of the riverfront. So um, this is our, the roles we see we, that, that, that William Penn Foundation plays or, or foundations can play in, in cities. You know, we really think that we have an opportunity to be a catalyst for change, that we as long-term stakeholders, you know, we don't, we're not subject to election cycles, we're not, uh, beholden to anyone but ourselves, that we have the ability to be independent and be, again, a catalyst for change. We can also be a force for helping raise expectations. This was a big problem in Philadelphia. People were accustomed to um, not being involved in decision making, assuming that someone else was going to do it, that deals were going to be make, made in, in, in a back room. 
And we also recognized that uh, to make anything sustainable, to make any kind of policy change that was durable, that we had to build a political constituency for planning. Uh, I've said many times that the plan that Harris led, uh, you know, our goal wasn't to create a plan, it was to create a client for a plan. It was to create demand for a plan, create market for a plan. Um, as an investor in the city, we also have the ability to make strategic investments. Um, Philadelphia, like a lot of places, is, is divided into councilmatic districts, and public investment is usually just a matter of cutting up the pie. Every councilman gets their piece of the pie. So it's very hard for cities like that to be strategic. However, when we are able to contribute capital to uh, investment decisions, it allows the city to use us as an excuse to be more strategic, to leverage our funding. Um, and finally, as uh, Donna will, will speak to in a moment, we are very interested in finding ways to institutionalize change. How do you make it, how do you make it last? How do you make it survive the inevitable change in, in mayoral and council administrations? So when it came to um, trying to promote a new way of thinking about the waterfront, we really made civic engagement the centerpiece of our work. And we did it for a couple of reasons. We felt that on, on the one hand, uh, any plan that needs to be based on what people in the local communities want, to, to legitimize it, to make it credible. It's not about our plan, it's not about elected officials' plan, it's about the, the desires of the community. You also need, if you're gonna implement a plan, uh, especially a long reign one, uh, public support to drive uh, plan uh, implementation. You also need that public support to transcend administrations. When we began the planning process, we were at the end of one term of a mayor with another mayor uh, administration pending. How do, you, how do you make sure that, that whatever planning you're, 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 you're doing is not rejected or put on the shelf as the, you know, the work of the last administration? And finally, we're very interested in private stewardship. We're very interested in people owning the kind of investments we make and protecting them and conserving them. Um, I'll close, I'm gonna turn it over to Harris, but I wanna talk about one internal tension within our foundation, which is um, a false choice, I really think, between policy and transactions. Um, you know, on one hand, folks, there's some folks who feel that you know, it's all about policy. You need policy from the top to, to, to flow down and direct and control change. There's another school of thought that says, well, actually, it's transactions, it's, it's development, it's projects that drive changes in behavior. So even in our, in our uh, organization, we've, we've, we've sort of gone back and forth about which way to focus. And, and to me, I, th I think it really is sort of a, a false choice. That really, you need both. You need, you need planning processes, long-range planning processes to make sure you're making good decisions, that you're making strategic decisions, but you also need early action specific concrete projects that demonstrate to people the kind of policy changes you're trying to achieve. So I sort of mush these together into my, to my personal model of citizen-based action-oriented planning. Now, if I was better at this, I would have arranged those words to create like a, a cool acronym. <laughs> but I don't, but I don't have that. But, 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 but these are the ingredients. We will not fund a planning effort in Philadelphia that doesn't involve citizen engagement on one end and doesn't also involve capital for early action. We want plans that will be implemented. We want plans to move directly from, from planning into action. And so that's the new model that we are, we are using. Um, I'm gonna segue now to Harris, who's gonna talk about a specific model or a demonstration of this process. Harris, you wanna come up? Uh, thank you, Sean. That was a fantastic kind of overview and setting the table for the work that I'm about to show. So there, there we go, okay. So uh, I'm Harris Steinberg. I am the director of Penn Praxis, which is the applied research arm of the School of Design at the University of Pennsylvania. My job is to facilitate faculty and student collaboration on real world projects across the five disciplines of the school, architecture, landscape architecture, city and regional planning, historic preservation, and fine arts. Uh, as a result of this kind of unique organism or entity that we have at the University of Pennsylvania, I'm able to work with folks like Sean McKinney at the William Penn Foundation to try new ideas, particularly in the city of Philadelphia. And as he said before during his opening, we were, he and the foundation were really looking for us to model a new process, new behavior, a new way of, of doing planning in Philadelphia. So what I'm gonna show you now is that test case. Uh, it's about the planning of the central Delaware Riverfront. 
uh, six and a half, seven miles of the waterfront from, for those of you who know Philadelphia, Allegheny Avenue at the north and Oregon at the south. It was an area of the city that was formerly what was known as, as Sean mentioned, the workshop of the world, a place where we made uh, virtually every kind of type of uh, um, ship, boat, um, train, uh, hats, felt, you name it, chocolate. This, this was an in intensely industrial waterfront. This is 1908. The city was expanding. We were building new park systems. We were building new um, subways that were really connecting parts of the city. This was the growing heart of the industrial metropolis. By the um, end of World War II, we were trying to envision what the future would be as we were beginning to think about the decline of, of the industrial city. This is a, a a uh, photograph from Ed Bacon's Better Philadelphia exhibition. For those of you who know the history of planning, 1947, uh, he, uh, uh, Oscar Stonerov and Louis Kahn create a uh, exhibition, three floors of Gimbel's department store in the heart of Philadelphia, to really picture the future, the post-industrial city of Philadelphia. It captured the imaginations of Philadelphians. Over 385,000 Philadelphians visited uh, this exhibition. Uh, school children came through, and it really created a whole generation of Philadelphians that were invested in the built environment. The legacy, however, was checkered, Bacon's legacy. Bacon became the planning director in Philadelphia, and while we created uh, some extremely beautiful and fine-grained historic restorations, we also tore apart parts of the city in a, in a very uh, 1960s kind of urban renewal way. So again, we had this history and legacy of looking ahead, but we also had a checkered uh, a, a past that we were dealing with. By the time we reached the 1990s and early 2000s, Sean talked about our charismatic mayor, Ed Randell. He was wonderful in terms of galvanizing civic interest and trying to kind of bring Philadelphia back from the depths of bankruptcy, but he also was selling us visions like this along our waterfront. <laughs> Believe it or not, this is a 400-car parking garage with a, a children's museum on top, and then there would be a tram that would be on top of that. This was a Rube Goldberg that was never meant to survive, and fortunately it didn't, uh, but it gave us an opportunity as, uh, as civic citizens in Philadelphia to actually try to organize kind of against this kind of action. But by the time um, uh, the, the millennium had come around, we, this was, we, were, we had come very far from the world that Ed Bacon had given us. But there were lots of people who were doing good work in the meantime. I've, I've used this term planners in exile. So while uh, official Philadelphia had sort of clamped down on vision and had become extremely transactional, you had going back into the 70s, Philadelphia Green, which was a, a, a project of the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society that was greening vacant lots. You had the work of the Center City District, which, which Paul talked about. Many uh, nonprofits and, and organizations, many of them funded by the William Penn Foundation, who were really doing the work on a case-by-case on a -case basis, on a on an issue-by-issue basis to try to mend the city back together and fight in many ways the, not only the decline, but the disinterest of the central administration. So uh, Sean painted the picture extremely well in terms of what the central Delaware, and this is the project area that, that I'm going to kind of give you a case study of, what it looked like in the middle of the of 2000s. We had intense real estate speculation in a city that really had not seen it, uh, real estate speculation, probably since the 1770s. Um, you know, this is not a city. Philadelphia grows in about 50-year increments. It's a, it's a Quaker city. There's a lot of consensus. It's, it's a great city in that respect. We don't necessarily destroy a lot of our past, but we don't do things quickly. And yet, by the middle of the 2000s, the, not only the 10-year tax abatement, but the funny money pre-crash was just uh, creating a building frenzy, and much of it here uh, along the central Delaware. What's important about this um, image, the, the figure ground, if you look at this big uh, gray kind of rope, if you will, of the highway, which is I-95 that cuts off traditional Philadelphia, which is the very dense row house neighborhood of, uh, of, of old Philadelphia, the river wards, as they're called, which are just to the west or the up on the screen. And then the, what, are, what look like vacant properties. This is, uh, as one consultant liked to say, the remains of the industrial glacier as it, as it left Philadelphia. All of these big post-industrial sites, some as big as 200 acres, were really being held by uh, folks who were just banking land waiting for a casino to be built there because for about 20 years, uh, the Philadelphia government as well as state government had said we'd be getting casinos and they were just in a sense holding the, the waterfront hostage. You'll also notice that New Jersey is to the south and we really don't show, what, or to the bottom of the page, that's the east, we don't show what that looks like 
but you can imagine there is a, a city called Camden on the other side, and Philadelphia uh, does, does have a relationship with it. Another interesting thing to note, and then I'll, I'll, I'll kind of uh, move on, is that the, the district that we decided to kind of work within, that the foundation was interested in us uh, doing this work, was within one councilmatic district. So while the river crosses geopolitical boundaries, in Philadelphia it's extremely important to be able to kind of work within the political structure where councilmen have a prerogative to, uh, um, to, to really oversee any development that goes within their district. So this was a, a test case within, within one councilmatic district that really began to put pressure on one councilman to start to affect change. Uh, an extremely fractured landscape. I talked about I-95, and it's, an, it's a pet peeve of mine because this is really what uh, separates our, our traditional, in many, many ways, what the new urbanists think of as urbanism we've had here again since 1682 when William Penn landed. We have a dense, walkable, uh, human-scaled environment that unfortunately Ed Bacon had cut off the riverfront uh, from traditional Philadelphia with I-95 and its connections back to the center of the city. But we also had a, had a fractured civic landscape. Because of, uh, of lack of planning and because of lack of trust between citizens and, and uh, agencies and, 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 and a variety of different ABC organizations, this was a, a landscape that many people had control over different pieces, but there was no vision to guide the whole. And as you'll see as I get into the story, we're talking about a, an area of the city that was really beginning to experience significant change, that had a, had a tremendous industrial past, but, but that shifting demographics, both in terms of the millennials and the baby boomers who are moving in, the new economies that were beginning to take over, uh, the historical underpinnings of the, not only the industry, but the, the colonial past, were all kind of embedded in a, in a, in a rich zone of the city with no um, uh, plan or vision to guide development. And so we had a waterfront that was becoming increasingly uh, cut off from its citizenry. We had gated communities that were being built along the waterfront. We had, uh, uh, of this five or six miles of waterfront, 95% uh, of the properties were privately owned. So there was very little potential to get significant public access, and yet that was a, 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 a key uh, objective of the planning process. And, oh, by the way, we had the Pennsylvania State Legislature uh, pass legislation in the dead of night on July 4th weekend of 2004 that there would be casino gambling in Pennsylvania. 14 casinos would be in the state, two would be in Philadelphia, and, and oh, by the way, you Philadelphia can't tell us where they go and what they look like and how you get to them. Our state senator who drafted the legislation, who was a Philadelphian, decided Philadelphia would make it too difficult, so he stripped us of our land use prerogative, and we were being told that we'd get two casinos, most likely down on the Delaware Riverfront. You can imagine the toxic brew of civic unrest that that unleashed in terms of, uh, of the, uh, uh, the citizenry, particularly along the river wards. Sean talked about the, the 12,000 or the, 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 uh, the 10,000 rooms that were being, or, or condominiums that were being built. 22 projects were being planned. That red, um, my, one might call it gesture, along the, um, the central Delaware would have been the, the second tallest building between New York and Chicago on uh, uh, a part of the riverfront that maybe there are two-story row houses just behind it. I mean, this was a, a crazy LSD-induced pre-grade, you know, this was funny money at its funniest, and yet we had to take it seriously. These projects were being entitled, they were going through city council, the land use was changing rapidly as we were trying to kind of jump up onto this train that, was, uh, that, that had no end in sight. So there was a call for a process, uh, a little bit of uh, a backstory. Penn Praxis, the, the, the office that I run at the University of Pennsylvania, which uh, I, I'm the founding director of, but it was founded by uh, former dean Gary Hack. Uh, 12 years ago when I arrived with uh, kind of all the turmoil in the built environment that we've talked about a bit, I began to create strategic relationships with our, uh, the mainstream media. Remember that, those days when we, newspapers actually meant something. Um, these were very powerful institutions 12 years ago, and the editorial pages in particular were extremely powerful. And, and the relationship that I built between uh, the, the design school at the University of Pennsylvania and the editorial board 
of the paper in conjunction with uh, colleagues of ours at the, at the university who are experts in civic deliberation and civic engagement. We created, we began to create a series of model processes that engage the citizens of Philadelphia, uh, the expertise of the university, and the editorial and kind of outreach uh, uh, potential of the newspaper to really begin to, to, to create a counter narrative to that which was being uh, uh, perpetuated by, by the establishment. And these, these uh, projects, which started out small, became very powerful. We were, we were, it was almost as if the Iron Curtain was lifting and Philadelphians were coming to meetings like this, in droves like this, and, and even big in numbers as we started to get, get moving, that really tapped into the thirst for engagement in determining the future of our city. They had been fed up with uh, being told what was good for them and what, and what would work because we were so desperate for any development. So this was about the, the partnerships between Penn Praxis and the, and the local press. Um, in the summer of 2006, at the, at the height of the kind of pre-Great Recession building frenzy, as, as casinos were being uh, kind of planned for the riverfront, there was a call for a process. This was the end of one administration, John Street, who's the mayor that you see in, that, uh, um, uh, in the article right there, uh, didn't really care very much about planning, but one of the councilmen whom he had become aligned with whose district the, the casinos and, and, the, and much of the development was being um, uh, kind of done in, really felt the need politically to have, a, have a, um, uh, a process. And Sean and I sat in meetings with the mayor, the, the district councilman, and, and a mem number of their staff members. And, and you know, I, I kid you not, this all came down to basically trying to outfox one of their political opponents. And so uh, a mayor who was not known to do anything quickly within three months signed an executive order authorizing Penn Praxis to do the work that I'm about to show you. It didn't hurt that the William Penn Foundation was paying significantly to, the, to do the work, but uh, uh, Sean's boss at the time, Feather Houston, was an extremely sophisticated political operative, and she knew that unless the mayor signed an executive order authorizing the work, she was not going to give a, a dime to the process that he really had to demonstrate that this was something that the city wanted. Uh, the mayor signed the executive order, and we were off and running. When I was asked to do the work by the chief of staff of the district councilman in the first district of, uh, of, of Philadelphia, I said I would do it under the following conditions. Number one, this would be citizen driven. In a city that had become uh, the kind of bastion of backroom deal making, this was all gonna be about what are the citizens of Philadelphia interested in? What are the values that are gonna drive this process? So we ultimately hosted 200 public meetings over 13 months that engaged over 4,000 citizens. And so the vision that I'll show you is based on that level of civic engagement. That it would be open and transparent, that there would be no behind closed doors meetings. So any meetings of an advisory group which were formed by the executive order of the mayor would actually be open to the public. You could come to those meetings. You could speak at those meetings. We had, we had folks come down from New York to talk to us, to inform the public. This was very much about uh, a process that was accountable, open, and transparent. And, and finally, the press would be involved. That would be uh, the, my trump card, if you will, that would ensure that this was an open and transparent process. With some of the funding from the William Penn Foundation, we created a website called planphilly.com, which has gone on to become a, uh, a, a, a web journalism site, actually run by professional journalists that cover the design and planning beat in Philadelphia. Many of these are journalists who are former uh, professional journalists with our two local dailies. But for the first nine months of its existence, it followed the process. It gave me the ability in public meetings to say, hey guys, you can act however you want. You can f shout and scream and, 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 and act like idiots. But by the time you get back to the, your office, this is all gonna be on the web because we're videotaping this and this is all part of the public record. So again, this is all before you had um, you know, cell phones with videos. Believe it or not, it's, only, it's 2006. But that level of transparency was critical to, to enabling us to come uh, follow through with a process that was valid. And it was an extremely fractious process. Casinos really bring out the best in people in terms of uh, showing up to meetings. You can get great numbers, but you also have to manage it in a way that really is authentic. Uh, add to that longshoremen who were afraid of losing their jobs. You know, people told me I should check my car before I got up in the morning. There, this was a, you know, Philly's a rough and tumble uh, on the waterfront kind of town, and this process 
certainly didn't um, uh, want for that. On the other hand, we worked with extremely uh, um, talented professionals who helped manage the public conversation in a way that really helped to distill tensions. And, and, and to be honest, before we did any of this, uh, my staff and I went around to all the community groups, all the different organizations, essentially on a, on a listening tour to introduce ourselves and to show that we weren't coming with any any answers? We were really here to help facilitate a process and to and to move a dialogue uh, forward. They were informed by best practices, much like we're doing today. We brought in people from elsewhere. I mean, that's that's a way to kind of validate your thinking, to show that other folks are doing it, to learn from people around the country, as well as from uh, uh, people within our city government, so that there was a dialogue between what we're doing uh, locally and what we're doing nationally and internationally. We created a set of principles, and this in many ways is the foundation of the work uh, that we do. These are values-based, so the process that we use to get to these principles are all initially about eliciting values from the citizens who attend the public meetings, what's important to them in terms of uh, their city, their region, their waterfront, whatever the issues it are. It's not about I want a Walmart here or I want a playground there. It's really more fundamental. And these become translated then ultimately through the filter of best practices into a set of planning principles that are backed up with a lot of, uh, of kind of data and language. But these become the language that the citizens, the elected officials, the press, and the public use to discuss the work. It's how we judge the work. And it really becomes an important part of the legacy of the process. We hosted a charrette with, um, and a workshop with architects and planners that came from around the world, Peter Latz from Germany, Walter Hood from Berkeley, many of our, our local um, uh, uh, and talented planning community. You can see the kind of response we got in terms of when we would show the results of that charrette in real time. We literally, kind of the, the designers walked onto the stage after three days of being at the Seaport Museum and presented their ideas. Um, some of the ideas that emerged had to do with sinking I-95, but also re-engaging with the industrial pass and, and, uh, and naturalizing the edges of the riverfront. Uh, wildly, kind of in many ways, antithetical to the development proposals that we had seen before, but these reflected not only the vision and values of the citizens, but the best practices that we had heard. And the press loved it. Uh, so much of what this process really is about is the partnership between the public and the press in moving an issue. If you've got uh, an authentic process, if it really is based on openness and transparency, you're going to have the support of the press, which is important, obviously, in terms of opinion makers. But it also validates the work of the citizenry. And I think the reciprocal relationship between the public and the press is something uh, to be very mindful of. Casinos continued to dog the issue. The Philadelphia City Planning Commission actually had to approve casinos on the waterfront as we were doing this work. So you can imagine how fractious it was. But ultimately from this, we came up with a very simple series of, of um, uh, systems that we used to put forward a vision for the waterfront. We were careful to say this is not a plan. We are not, there are no takings involved in this. We're not planting streets. But we are reflecting the will of the people of Philadelphia who participated in this process to create a vision for the future. So the first was really to create a grid of streets over what was that no man's land, 1,100 acres, almost the size of center city Philadelphia that would break down the scale of the street, of the, of the scale of the, of the area, connect back into the city, and become uh, part of a future network of transportation. A, a network of green spaces, trails, edges, uh, parks, and, um, and, and green connector streets. So where there is currently about eight acres of green space and 1,100 acres, we were proposing about 330 acres, just redressing the balance. And trying to, through a very sort of strategic alignment of waterfront trails as well as larger park spaces, give the, the adjoining neighbors, 60,000 people who live near the riverfront, a 10-minute walk to a major park along the water. And finally, the rest was development. There was lots of pressure on me to determine what was actually going to go in the different parcels along the waterfront and where the casinos would be built. And I said, when William Penn came in 1682 and laid down a grid here, he didn't know that casinos were going to be built here. He just said, These are, this is how we're going to move about the city. We're going to do the same thing. We're not going to be bogged down by land use, because that can stop the debate. We're going to talk about what the public realm is, what the quality of the streets are, what the scale of the, of the, of the, of the parks are, because that's going to be the lasting uh, gift that we're going to give to the city. And then uses can change. There are going to be uses that we haven't thought of that will eventually come. 
we went back to the citizens. We had this iterative feedback loop. It was really a continual process of saying, did we get it right? Did we, did we hear it right? Developers finally started to kind of take us seriously and began to mount a fairly sophisticated behind closed doors attack on the planning process. What you see here is a picture of me presenting a, a version of the plan before it's released to the Philadelphia City Planning Commission just for information only. But you have a former director of the City Planning Commission who had gone over to the dark side who was trying to di <laughs> discredit the process as not being valid because we were essentially goring sacred cows. We were bringing them, we were forcing them to come out into the sunlight to talk about projects, to talk about uh, uh, the public good, and this was rattling some fairly uh, 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 powerful people. But again, the press responded and created what I call a civic force field around this process. Again, not only when you've got 4,000 people have participated in the process, when you have about 172 different articles over a 12-month period that are focusing positively on a process like this, it's very difficult to, uh, to, to kind of uh, deflate it. And the press played an incredible role in that. So by the time I presented this process, and many people had obviously seen it as it was going along, but the final unveiling at the uh, Pennsylvania Convention Center in November of 07, 1,500 people come to see a plan. I mean, imagine that. It's, it's just an absolutely staggering um, uh, concept. But, but by the end, people were standing. There was a standing ovation for, again, a plan. And, and the wonderful part about it, not that there were, not that there were so many people there, but we, we, it was almost like a, a convention. You had, you had the longshoremen. You had the college educated. You had the working class. There, this really had tapped into a whole cross-section of Philadelphia's socioeconomic strata that showed the, the power of civic engagement in the planning process. Uh, I'm going to quickly show you uh, some of the before and after shots that we showed Philadelphians because ultimately visuals really help drive home kind of what we can do. This is our, uh, what's called Penn's Landing, which is not where Penn actually landed because this is landfill, but it's now a, um, uh, this is where that, that, that parking lot with the museum on top and the tram was going to be, and the, that stanchions over there are the Stonehenge remains of what would have been an aerial tram to Camden. The most important part of this are the ramps at that, where I-95 is. So we imagined a city that actually took down I-95. I jokingly would say they can let it go through New Jersey, because that's essentially where, it, what it, where the main north-south route is anyhow, and, and give the city back this very gradual and gracious uh, kind of connection between river and street that's only about an eight-foot rise, which right now feels like it's a 600-foot gap, but create um, an elegant urbanism at the shores of the Delaware. Uh, at the northern end of the district, we have the former Port Richmond Rail Yards, once the, one of the busiest rail yards in the world during the Workshop of the World days. How could you imagine the extension of uh, Philadelphia over or under I-95 into a more perhaps a kind of industrial or um, kind of office complex? How do, you, how do we deal with the edges of I-95 and the, the areas underneath it in more progressive ways that could manage stormwater, uh, mediate the sound, and create uh, positive amenities as opposed to the gash between the communities that we have now? How do, we, how do we engage some of these industrial relics that really are just kind of hanging out there at the northern end of the districts but could in one time become really the foundation for a new community? Here at Penn's Landing, which has really languished for 40 years with a succession of different over-the-top developments, we essentially said create a, a great lawn, let the city come up to the edges of it and create, uh, what, like in any of the, of the great cities of the world, just a beautiful edge uh, to the city at the river. We then went on, uh, as, as Sean said, with the support of a new mayor to create an action plan. So we didn't stop at just the vision. Uh, a new administration came in and embraced this. Having 1,500 people at a convention center with a standing ovation does get the attention of a new mayor. And we were able to, with uh, continued funding from the William Penn Foundation, come up with an action list of 10 things you've got to do in the next 10 years, which they have done remarkably. The first was to actually reform the disgraced waterfront corporation uh, that, had, that had really failed to develop the waterfront. You can see the banner headline that that engendered over there. So again, the relationship between action, press, public, and, and, and policy. Uh, the impact has been profound. Uh, the mayor not only uh, changed the Waterfront Corporation, has made it an open and, and transparent organization. There has been the creation of an advocacy group that meets every month to ensure that 
The city is actually following the vision. It's called the Central Delaware Advocacy Group. And the water, new Waterfront Corporation has prepared and, and adopted a new waterfront plan which hues very closely to the values and, and vision of the civic vision. So you can see that the work is, is continuing. There are a number of early action projects. Many of them have been funded by the William Penn Foundation. A, a new pier, which is on, on the right, or on the, this is the left on your screen, uh, by James Corner Field Operations, the designer of the High Line in New York, who's a member of our faculty. A uh, one acre uh, pier at the foot of Ray Street that is now an extremely elegant uh, kind of urban oasis. There are some of these other early actions that the, the foundation is, is funding all of which really are, are meant to demonstrate that this is not just about planning, it's not just long range, but it's tangible and it's going to serve the needs of those who, who are adjacent. Uh, some of the lessons learned, I'm not gonna go into them, this is the last slide, but I think you get the idea uh, that um, the, the relationship between a foundation that can take the long view, in the case of the, the, uh, the University of Pennsylvania and Penn Praxis that was seen as an honest broker, the role of the citizens, the role of the press, all of which came together, right time, right place, right actors, uh, to, to make a lasting change on the city of Philadelphia. Don is now going to, to take it home in terms of how the city and the current administration has institutionalized, internalized, and really made this the new normal. Uh, for what was a almost, uh, I'll use the, word, use the word Wild West, which maybe I shouldn't because I'm in San Antonio, um, <laughs> on the central Delaware is now um, what we do kind of in a quite civil fashion. Donna, yes. I don't like going last because I always get shortchanged in time. Uh, <laughs> I have about 20 minutes, so are we good? Okay, good. I think I'm gonna ask um, Sean to teach in the Institute the History of Philadelphia. I really liked that, that was really good, thanks. <laughs> I'm the director of the Philadelphia Citizens Planning Institute and I'm here to talk about the CPI, as we call it, citizen planner model for building a constituency for planning. Considering that CPI is a staff of one, uh, that's me, it may be useful to share with you where I'm coming from I'm not a planner. Professionally, I'm an architect. I'm not from Philadelphia, though I live there now, and I do love where I live. I'm not a Planning Commission staff member, though I'm a consultant, and I do work with staff. So when I say we, that's what I'm referring to. All this to say that um, coming into this was somewhat of an outsider perspective. And I've been learning right along with all the people in the Institute. And also, I have a long history of working as a civic volunteer and making fish heads to wear in parades. And I don't just collect degrees, I really do love learning. When I came on as a consultant to the Planning Commission in 2010, I was told the intent of the CPI was to be the outreach and education entity of the Planning Commission. Go. Here's a list of some of the outcomes that were identified before I got there um, when they got their funding through our initial William Penn Foundation uh, grants. And some key words there, I'm not gonna read this, is better informed citizenry, expand relationships, increase capacity to educate, and increase citizen support. Before I talk about CPI, what, what it is, and about the outcomes for this kind of citizen engagement, you need to understand the context. What was going on in the city that made informing the public and gaining support so important? And that was called the Integrated Planning and Zoning Process. And that actually won a National Planning Award for Best Practice last year. Prior to 2010, the last major revision of the original 1933 zoning code was done in 1962, and the last comprehensive plan was done in 1960. So they were both a little bit out of date. And here are what I'm showing. Um, after a 2007 voter referendum calling, I think 80% of the voters called for zoning reform. And the statistics here show the extensive public participation that was done over a four year reform period. And I can't get into the whole um, zoning code reform effort, but from a public participation perspective, what's important about the new code are new procedures which codify the role of citizens in the development approval process, which promotes much greater predictability and transparency in the process. And two of those are called uh, registered community organizations and civic design review. 
The planning initiative, branded as Philadelphia 2035, started in 2010 and focuses on the physical development of the city over the next 25 years. The citywide vision was mostly a one-year planning process and was driven almost entirely by planning commission staff. It's important to note that this was a key platform of Mayor Nutter's office who recognizes the importance of long-range planning and was also supported by the creation of a new deputy mayor of economic development and planning position. Also important was that this was designed to be a really inclusive process, and you can, I think you can read that, with an outside advisory board comprised of some um, key uh, thought leaders in the city, a city working group, which which was composed of all city agencies and incorporated the work of a lot of previous plans such as Green 2015 by the Parks Department, Green Works by the Mayor's Office of Sustainability, Green City Clean Waters by the Water Department and also the Delaware Wa uh, Riverfront Action Plan. There were, for public outreach, there were two rounds of four meetings each, a public meetings held in various parts of the city in the first round, we used a mapping exercise to select, solicit big ideas on different types of development projects, such as parks and trails, rapid transit expansion, and they had little key um, game pieces there to make their maps. We asked table teams to identify their top five ideas and then name their map to reflect those priorities. And there you can see Walk Adelphia. There was a lot, lots of other very funny names. In the second round, attendees looked at three maps, each one reflecting the projects that corresponded with the three big themes. And that's how the comprehensive plan was organized, around those themes, thrive, connect, and renew. They were given a budget and some play money that would pay for only half of the total cost of the projects on each of those maps. And they had to decide as a group which one of those projects to fund. So that was a really um, good exercise in prioritizing with limited budgets. Prior to our big celebration to adopt this citywide vision, the public had another opportunity to provide feedback on the draft plan online, as well as the many city agencies we worked with. Here you can also see participants from the CPI pilot and spring class being recognized with their certificates. And I think that meeting um, wasn't as impressive as yours with 1,500 people, but I think there was close to 300 people at that. Uh, Philadelphia 2035 was designed as two phases. The first one is the citywide vision, which I just talked about, and the next one is the smaller scale district level series of plans, which is happening now over the next five to six years. And these are shorter range strategies and recommendations that are about five to 10 years looking in the future that tie back to the citywide comprehensive vision. There will be 18 district plans. You can see how the city's divided there. Generally three done per year. And these are also, again, done in-house by staff. It also includes a parcel by parcel surveying of every, yeah, every single parcel in the city, something that's never been done before. I think that's really amazing. Um, it applies the citywide goals and recommends capital projects, land use changes, and it guides remapping, a zoning remapping, which is our key tool in planning. And it also creates a framework for future neighborhood plans. For each district plan, there's a steering committee, and that's comprised of community stake stakeholders, business institutions, residents, and representatives from city agencies, as well as um, city council offices. The third, there are three public meetings. The first one is a mapping exercise to identify areas of strengths and concerns. And the second one is a prioritization exercise based on, our, on um, their feedback from the first meeting and data research. And then the third open, um, open, is an open house where the draft plan presents key recommendations and we get, again, people's feedback on that. The bottom photo shows the largest crowd we had at any of these meetings, almost 200 people for University Southwest. The district plans uses those three big themes from the citywide vision to apply specific project and land use recommendations. And you can see all these completed plans on the Phila 2035 website. In the plan, also, there's an implementing action section that lists all the city agencies and other organizations that will need to collaborate to actually implement and get each recommendation done. 
Last year marked the adoption of the two Metropolitan Center plans, the Central and University Southwest, and the sixth graduating class of CPI, and the mayor attended that as he does almost all of our celebrations. You can see his little head there circled in red. Um, <laughs> He's a, he's a big promoter. And we also had our first graphic progress report on the citywide vision. We handed that out. It's, it's a yearly calendar, but it compiles progress on that citywide vision. How are we doing from all city agencies? So how do we get the word out? You're probably all familiar with those kind of traditional ways of getting the word out. We have a, a planning commission has an email list of about 3,000 plus names that get regular updates. For the University Southwest plan, we used two new tools to try to get a younger demographic involved. And one of those, maybe some of you have heard of this Textazen, which was designed by Code for America, or otherwise known as Peace Corps for Geeks. And it asked specific questions that can be answered by texting. And those questions were posted on buses, on bus shelters, and train stations. And we had 700 respondents for three questions. And over 500 of those responses for, was for the transit-related question. Big surprise. Um, and Community Planet was an online game that you advanced through different levels. It had questions and projects specific to that University Southwest District. And you could also promote ideas for projects, and it resulted in one idea being voted as the winner, and they actually won actual money, of $500, to implement that idea. So kind of a crowdfunding idea. So now you've heard an overview very quickly of the two components, two components of the integrated planning and zoning process and a little bit about our public outreach. Now I'm gonna talk about the third and I think the most important part, which is the Citizens Planning <laughs> Institute. You can see how there might be a need to help the general public explain and advocate for these new planning and zoning initiatives that were new in the city. And CPI was designed to expand the constituency for planning and build capacity for conversations about planning and development in every neighborhood, not just those neighborhoods that had the most resources. CPI has become an umbrella brand for a growing number of outreach and education activities, but at its core, it's a series of classes. We offer two sessions per year, one in the spring and one in the fall. We receive between 60 and 100 applications for 30 seats. And the course now is composed of three-hour evening classes. There are three core classes. You see on the screen here the fall, for the fall course last year. And three electives with topics that change in each series. An optional Saturday workshop and a course project, which could be an action plan for a particular, particular project. In last fall's session, we also heard from a graduate of the program, and I'd like to do more of that, bringing back graduates um, for a little peer-to-peer -peer learning to share lessons learned and their successes. After our pilot course, which was just those three core classes, we, based on feedback, we added elective classes, which change in each session, and participants need to take at least two of these electives to earn their certificate. Last fall, we had an elective on vacant land, which was very timely because we had a national conference in Philadelphia on reclaiming vacant land. And I should mention, too, all of our instructors are volunteer. They come from public and private and nonprofit sectors. Some of the other electives we've had in the past is commercial corridor development. That's always very popular. Um, preserving a sense of place in neighborhoods about historic preservation. Greening Philadelphia through better design, making your organization more effective, because again, most of the participants are working as volunteers. So how do they build capacity at a neighborhood level? And this spring, I'm gonna offer um, electives on riverfront development and parkland stewardship. And good planning begins with good data, which is looking at kind of DIY mapping and how you use data. In designing the institute, I did dozens of interviews with staff, other city agencies, and neighborhood civic leaders to learn what the needs were, uh, what did they think the gaps were in, in information, and how this new institute should be structured, as well as research on other academies across the country. For the Learn to Plan, Plan to Change workbook that they get at the very beginning, I borrowed a DIY planning approach I actually found on San Antonio's uh, Planning Commission's website, which is very interesting. Um, and I did credit um, San Antonio's uh, 
effort there. And it's called the Goals and Strategies Report, and there's a number of, of those reports that have actually been done in Philadelphia now. So I was very excited about that. A key part of classroom learning is the interactive nature of classes. There are presentations by our volunteer instructors, but group exercises in each class make space for learning from each other and practice in teamwork, empathy, and role playing. New for last fall, we were able to offer a number of scholarships by making a champion level of support available on the application, and that meant that person paid for one other person's core course fees. And last fall, we had 24 neighborhoods represented in the class, and there are about 165 of, you know, unofficial neighborhoods in Philadelphia from 11 of those 18 planning districts I showed earlier. At the upper left is a table team who won a fake $10,000 check <laughs> for their doggy park action plan. And that action planning is a really key thing. I like to promote their, that for their course project because it gets them thinking about planners. What's the first step we need to take? What are the resources we need? Who do we need to talk to? And it's, it's, you know, I want to make it fun, um, but that's how they um, get practice for the real money. A national survey on citizen planning academies was conducted in 2012 by Lynn Mandarano at Temple University School of Environmental Design. And you can see the five locations there at the top of the slide. The survey included over 50 questions. And I should mention Philadelphia had the highest response rate. Um, <laughs> the study hasn't been published yet, but it received, I received partial results. Um, from the Philadelphia respondents, and you can see some of the key questions there I thought were significant. Um, important feedback is how having exposure to real people working in city agencies breaks down that us and them barrier, us in the city. And a big shift in how participants perceive and feel a part of city government. And one quotation I like to cite is, I now know there are good people doing amazing work for our city. I have an, a student intern now doing more re, to update the research, and she's found about 19 comparable citizen planning academies across the country. So how do we measure what we're doing? What, how do we measure success and outcomes? And that's really the feedback that we get from our participants. And the success of the program depends on our participants, what they take away and how they use it. Um, how they're able to use and how they stay connected. So here's some of those responses back. Um, I have many, many of these. Um, <laughs> some of them on, are on the website. An important part of the program is accepting participants from geographically diverse parts of the city for each round so they learn more about the city as a whole. And that's why I particularly like that first quotation, my sense of community expanded to include the whole city. So they're not just thinking about their neighborhoods isolated. Um, they're thinking about how what benefits that neighborhood is going to benefit the entire city. Graduates are invited to return and take electives for any seats not taken by new students. And at that time, they return a six-month check-in so I can update uh, their information and learn about what they're doing in their neighborhoods. And I show this slide because I think it's a continuous improve. It's a process of continuous improvement. I feel really strongly about maintaining a high quality um, in terms of what we are delivering in content, our instructors, the participants. Um, in each class, I have a pretty extensive evaluation form that I hand out and we take action on. I use focus groups and surveys, um, so it's a rich uh, source of improvement. Good planning hopefully leads to real projects, as we've been talking about. Last month, we held a celebration called The Power of the Plan, Making It Happen. And this featured storytelling of, at this event, four projects that show how a plan was essential to make their project come about. And I had this brainy idea, instead of having people stand up here and you know, talk, that I would have them stand on hot button. Those are actually coffee tables. And they had um, 10 minutes. And if we talked longer than 10 minutes, I made them get off the coffee table. <laughs> um, and we had close to, uh, well, we had over 200 people come to that event, so again. At this event, the two-year progress report calendar was distributed, and the August 
um, month in this calendar features progress on the Citizens Planning Institute. And you can see that we've had 210 participants to date, representing 17 of the 18 planning districts. And those participants influence over 400 different neighborhood-based organizations, because many of these people serve on more than one um, organization. And we've also had over 65 volunteer instructors. Uh, some of those come back again and again. I don't know why, but they seem to love it. Um, and it also listed some of the many occupations of graduates, and that's really interesting because it reflects, it truly reflects the diversity of the city as a whole. Here's graduates from last year's two sessions. So what do, what do graduates do? What do citizen, citizen planners do? They serve on some of our district plan steering committees. They help our staff out with facilitation at public meetings. They've sponsored community zoning workshops to educate others about the new zoning code. And they generally act as planning ambassadors in all corners of the city. Also on our um, website, Citizen Planning Institute, we have a Grads in Action page, which is kind of a blog-like page, that highlights stories of what grads are doing, and that's a terrific evidence of the impact of the program. Um, Joyce Smith, um, she was in our pilot class, and I use, she's kind of our poster child. I trot her out at all kinds of events. Um, she demonstrates the empowerment aspect of CPI. They're dealing with really high vacancy in her neighborhood in a two-block area. And she's just gone through a uh, partnering with a nonprofit to get a really intensive, extensive neighborhood plan done that is attracting developers um, as we speak. And Dwayne Drummond is a young man from Mantua, a particularly troubled neighborhood where there was no civic organization. And he became the new president of a new civic after he graduated. And just as San Antonio has, this neighborhood was recently named one of the five National Promise Zones. And Duane and another CPI grad from Mantua went to DC and met the president as part of that. So that's a cool story. Somebody said to me at one of the public meetings, why should I care about 2035? I'll be dead by then. <laughs> and um, the importance of planning, as we all know, is the slow but steady steps of implementation. It's not the end goal. It's not from here to 2035. So to create the city we want for our children, we have to start today. And when we worked on the citywide vision, we hosted a poster contest and it generated 170 submissions from 18 schools of fourth and seventh and 11th graders. And they did posters illustrating their vision of the city. And you can see the winners in the 2035 vision plan. I think that's cool. So, that was fast. This is my last slide. Um, we'll be marking the eighth session this spring. Applications start March 1. <laughs> and, uh, Thank you very much for bringing us. I've really enjoyed meeting a lot of you, and I hope this was helpful. We have about 20 minutes for a question answer, and I want to start off with a question to our, our panel, which is our three speakers from Philadelphia. Um, we, we took all of them uh, with us today to go to the mayor's State of the City address and to get them a little bit more grounded in what some of the identified issues are and accomplishments that the community is rallying around. And one thing that the, the mayor said during the State of the City was that as we work together on these initiatives, we know it won't happen quickly. So time was a recurring theme in all these presentations from 1776 to 1876 to 1976 um, to this uh, question of uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the pressures of time when you're being told we don't have time to go through a planning process to the idea of engaging citizens over a period of time uh, to get them prepared to, to really participate. But one thing came up in each of your presentations and I was just hoping you could recap for this group because it's something I hear very frequently in San Antonio. So you have the understanding that it takes time to plan and time to execute, but then you also have this notion that, well, why should I care what's happening in 2035, and why should I work on a plan when I may never see it implemented, and if it doesn't get implemented, then you get this, um, this sense of disappointment and what's been called planning fatigue. 
So with that notion of time and the requirements of time for a plan to be implemented, could each of you address what you think you do in your funding and your practice to combat the sense of planning fatigue in the citizens that you're relying on to, to make these plans reality? Should I, should I start? Um, I suppose I touched on it a little bit already, but uh, you know, I'm a reformed city planner myself. Uh, I should have revealed that earlier. Um, and you know, like, like a lot of people, I'm very impatient to see change. Uh, growing up in Philadelphia, people would always say, oh, Philly has such great potential. And I'm like, I want to see the potential now. So we, we, as I said earlier, we, we've really committed that if we're going to invest in planning, we're also going to invest in capital. That, that we, we you know, really believe that if you don't have early action right away after, to, as part of your, your planning process, you really lose the momentum, you really lose the energy. And as, as Harris said, I think it's really elegantly, you know, you need to show people, pe people, people believe the change they can see, right? And so if, by having projects emerge immediately that sort of demonstrate the kind of things you're talking about, I think that's, that's, the, that's the best way to convince people that planning has a purpose. Again, it takes years to unfold. But I, I really think you have to, sh you know, show folks from the very beginning uh, what you're talking about with physical investment. Do you want to, guys want to add to that or? Okay. Yeah, um, Leela, I think there's maybe two parts to the converse, to the question. One is kind of temporal and time and uh, investment that people are going to make in actually envisioning the future and what role do they play. And then the second piece, which I think is not stated, but is um, how valid is that engagement? Do they really feel like they're part of it? So I think when folks feel like they're actually an authentic part of the conversation and the process and their voice is being heard, it really, I think, changes the dynamic and it becomes less cynical and more um, kind of not only what are we working to, but how can we make things happen quickly. What's interesting about San Antonio is that you have a tremendous legacy of planning. What we learned today when we walked the river walk with you and uh, 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 today was that over 100 years ago, this was envisioned. And you are the inheritors, much like we in Philadelphia, of a tremendous legacy of planning. So you have no further to look than, you know, there's no place like home. Uh, not many cities have that. And I think that's, that, that was a wonderful starting point that we had in Philadelphia, is that we could look to William Penn's plan. We could look to the creation of Fairmount Park. We could look to the Benjamin Franklin Parkway. We knew that there were these milestones in time where folks were thoughtful, where they've laid the template for generations to come, and that we could now add our chapter to that ongoing narrative. What was important, though, was to really um, create a place where people felt that they were authentically part of the process in an open and transparent process, where it wasn't just a formal check off on a, on, a, on a list of things that had to be done in order for a project to happen. Add to that, then, the William Penn Foundation's imperative that there has to be early action. And I think you have a recipe for a successful engagement that can both long-range planning, because you need that to do anything that's really uh, honest, but also um, uh, quick action that gets people in, in a 24-hour news cycle the kind of um, uh, results they need. Um, what I, I think that the importance of an education-based program like this, it's a reality check. You know, I have instructors that come in and they can share those stories of what it actually takes to get something built, like the Franklin Payne Skate Park, park that was part of this um, celebration last month. That was a 15-year process. Um, so it tempers some of the expectations, which is a good thing, but it's also at a neighborhood-based level, I like to say, you know, radio station WIIFM. Does everybody know what that is? What's in it for me? Um, you have to address your constituency in, at your neighborhood, you have to take action, and again, just to repeat, you have to, you, there's no action too small, but do something small and do it well and do it successfully, and that will lead to the next step. So planning is just one small step after another. So one step at a time, celebrate it, move on to the next step. I think that's really key for the ordinary citizen to understand what planning takes. Thank you for your response to that question. Do we have any other questions? This is a cordless mic, so if there's anyone in the audience who has a question, I'll bring the mic back there to you. 
And also, if you could just state your name. We are doing this for NowCast and try to be clear in your question so that everyone can hear it. Hi, thank you all for coming down to San Antonio. Uh, I was actually born in Philadelphia. <laughs> I lived there until 93 and moved down, been down here for 20 years. Uh, my name is Rene Gonzalez. I'm a student um, studying public administration at San Antonio College here. Uh, reports and presentations have been uh, recently released stating that our downtown is operating at a 67% occupancy rate, 67 between 70, somewhere around there. Uh, so that's basically one in every three uh, buildings are vacant, and in fact, there are entire blocks of our downtown where the entire, uh, where a multitude of lots are actually vacant. Um, so I was wondering in your uh, planning efforts, have you come across this issue, and if you have, are there any um, prescriptive alternatives, or are there any steps or measures um, that we could take, that the city could take, uh, to sort of address this issue. Thank you. Yeah, there's a, so Philadelphia um, has experienced a uh, vacancy of that, of that scale. Um, in the early, uh, late 80s and early 90s, there was an office tower building boom, and it created a tremendous amount of uh, square footage of new Class A office spaces, and it basically emptied out every old office building downtown. And uh, so Center City had a lot of dark, uh, buildings in it. And that was one of the motivations of the 10-year tax abatement. It essentially uh, initially was motivated to subsidize the conversion of all of those empty Class B, Class C office buildings into residences. It was actually most of the new, new construction, new condominium construction that occurred in Philadelphia was actually not new construction. It was the conversion of old office buildings to residences. And that repopulated downtown. I mean, I think, uh, I'm trying to remember the exact number, but I think that produced, that problem, program alone produced about 25,000 new residents in downtown. And, you know, um, that makes a huge impact on any city. Um, now, that's center city. Philadelphia also suffers from vacancy out, outside of downtown. It's a city that in 2000, we, for the first time, mapped all the vacant land in Philadelphia and uh, discovered, to our surprise, about 40,000 vacant lots in the city. Um, now, everyone was aware there's vacancy in the city. Everyone knew a vacant lot in their neighborhood or, or were aware of near parts of the city that were, were not doing so well. But until we mapped it all, no one had any idea of the scale of, of, of the problem, that essentially we had that much uh, vacancy in the city. So, um, you know, a number of strategies have been employed. Uh, when Mayor Street took, took office, one of the first things he initiated was the Neighborhood Transformation Initiative, which is designed to basically remove vacant ba buildings or blighting structures in the city. I don't remember, do you know how many structures were demolished? Huge, huge number of structures. And then uh, other programs uh, were developed to sort of come in behind that and stabilize that land. Harris mentioned the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society. They created a national model called uh, Philadelphia Green that basically took possession of that land and turned lots of those vacant lots into private parks, open spaces for neighborhoods, community gardens. It's, 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 it's a huge problem though still. I mean, I, I, you know, th that program has addressed a small fraction of the vacancy in this city. Um, it, it's something we are, we are struggling with for sure. But, uh, and there's no easy or, or uh, simple answer or solution to it. What's, fortunately what's happening for Philadelphia is that for the first time in 60 years, our population is growing again. Uh, Philadelphia was two million people in 19, in 1960, two million, two million people in 1960. We did a comprehensive plan that said we'd grow to 2.5 million and we declined to 1.5. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where uh, Ed Bacon was leading this great planning effort and didn't even realize we were standing on the edge of a cliff. Um, but since uh, 1960, the population declined to 1.5 million, and in 2010, for the first time, uh, we started seeing population recovery. So our hope is that, you know, we are now projecting, I think, 100,000 new residents. Yeah. Not a, huge, not a huge amount, but again, knowing what 25,000 people did to downtown, 100,000 new residents in the city can really help address incrementally over a long time, absorb some of that vacant land. Beautiful. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you have any more? <laughs> any more questions? 
Hi, my name is uh, Mark Kelman. I'm an architect in San Antonio. The, uh, I noticed that there was such a substantial amount of uh, planning issue there. I'm wondering if you had yielded a project that actually settled your uh, pet peeve about the population unable to make it across the highway. <laughs> Why don't you take that one? <laughs> um, we have not settled that one yet, unfortunately. The, uh, the, the current master plan for the central Delaware that was done on the heels of the vision actually shows a cover over a portion of the highway, uh, which is about a quarter of a billion dollar project. So whether or not it gets done, I think, is, is a question, but there at least is the intent to do a piece of it. Um, the irony, of course, is that uh, federal highways are, going to be, are being rebuilt every 50 years, and this highway is at the end of its, um, its lifespan in about 20 years. So we, we really have the opportunity as a city now to call the question, are we going to rebuild it in kind, or do we take a different attack in terms of how we uh, manage traffic through the city? And, and the current administration has just not been interested in, um, in having that conversation. That doesn't mean we won't have it, and we have an election coming up in a year and a half and I'm hoping that um, that, that becomes part of the, uh, the, the public conversation. Just, just to, um, so there is the, the, the vision or the idea of burying I-95, but one of Harris's also re uh, other recommendations in the civic vision was to reconnect and extend the grid of the city to the river. And we're actually doing that. Uh, we have six new connector street projects underway. We're actually building new streets under I-95 to the riverfront. We're trying to come up with uh, innovative design to improve the appearance of the underside of the, vi of the elevated viaduct, new lighting, public art. Um, so we're, we, it's, you know, who knows how much to bury 985? Is it 20 billion? Is it 30 billion? We don't know. But we're not letting that, we're not, we didn't pin all our hopes on burying I-95. The civic vision doesn't succeed or fail if I-95 isn't buried. We have a series of different strategies to deal with getting people to the river, and we're actually building those right now. Yeah, we, we were uh, chastened, by, chastened by the big dig as we were uh, doing our work, and the, uh, the then Deputy Secretary for Transportation in Pennsylvania was breathing down my neck at every, every line that we drew to make sure that we didn't show... She had previously worked for the Massachusetts <laughs> Transportation Authority. It didn't, didn't show anything that uh, appeared to take a side in terms of um, uh, burying it or not, but uh, it's, it's, it remains a big issue. The, the decking that Harris uh, talked about, the, uh, it's the Great Lawn, actually, that Harris referred to. That project is, as Harris said, is a $250 million project. We are exploring a combination of federal loans through the TIFIA program, the same program that Rahm Emanuel used to build the $100 million river walk in Chicago. We're also looking at a combination of city and state bonding to generate the revenue uh, for that. Uh, that decking won't preclude covering the rest of I-95, but it will create that most critical connection between the very heart of Center City and the river's edge. Well, we're right at about 7.30. Um, I'm going to take one more question here before we go. So I live in an inner city neighborhood, and although I love a lot of what I see going on, the river reach improvements, linear creekways, especially in the area of public spaces and green spaces. I also know that there's the programs that are designed to bring back the decade of downtown are also causing a lot of stress for these inner city neighborhoods and things are moving very quickly and people are concerned about those changes and gentrification and so forth. But you don't want to arrest the development necessarily because it may not come back. I mean, you may end up going through then a, a lengthy period of, of decline or stagnation. So how do you balance? We're just now talking about looking at our comprehensive plan, and yet we have all kinds of things already happening, buildings being demolished, parks, the Hemisphere Park redevelopment project, big projects. And so how do we catch up this public process to what's already in the pipeline and going on without saying stop 
and then potentially creating, you know, shooting ourselves in the foot to a degree. So, so we're looking for some free consulting advice here from, from the folks in Philadelphia. <laughs> but you, you start where you are, right? I mean, it's about a conversation, and it's about being transparent about what's going on and bringing as many people who care about that together. I mean, I, I, I don't know. There isn't any magic bullet, right? But, you know, I'm, I'm from an education proponent background, and I think you've got to start the conversation with good information and, and get away from the emotional issues, if possible, and that's based on good information and data and being honest. You know, this is, this is our history. This is where we are. And now, today, going forward, what do we want it to be? And that's a collaborative and inclusive process. And there aren't any easy answers. <laughs> yeah, no, I think Donna hit the, the nail on the head. Uh, one, of, one of the stories I told this morning at the breakfast is that um, one of, I think one of the most powerful components of an of a, of a authentic civic engagement process is uh, the ability to create an informed electorate so that your job as a citizen really is to understand the issues. What are the tensions? What are the trade-offs? And be treated as an adult, not necessarily as somebody who's just being told what's, what, what's going to happen. And if you enter into that kind of honest dialogue with the elected officials and policymakers, you can then offer informed advice, and you can help with the decision making. And then it becomes something that everybody owns. Uh, that's, that's not easy work, but it's really, as far from what we've seen, the only way you can move an authentic process that starts with, as, as Sean just whispered, my effects on the ground. Where are we now? What do we know? What are the issues? And how can we begin to make sense of it in a way that, that, that meets multiple value sets? Because we're not a monolithic culture. We're, 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 all, fr we're all friends here, right? I can, I can tell the, the real story, right? So, I mean, uh, so this process looked very orderly, didn't it? Uh, you know, one thing led after another. The, the funny thing is, uh, and I don't want to tell on uh, Donna, but... Uh, we actually started the zoning first uh, in 2007. That's what I said. That's uh, what did I said. you yes. did you reveal that secret? Yes. <laughs> yeah, we and, and then we realized, oh geez, we don't have a comprehensive plan. <laughs> so we had to actually start a whole comprehensive planning process in a very quick, accelerated way to catch up to the zoning that was already happening. Uh, so I mean, I give the I give a lot of credit to our mayor and our deputy mayor, Alan Greenberger, who is trained in architect, longtime activist in the city who actually, you know, went, in, went into, uh, into the administration and pulled together in an amazing comprehensive plan very quickly mm -hmm. to sort of catch up to the zoning process. It's not tidy. It's not perfect. It's, you, 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 there are plenty of times where when Harris and I would say, guy, I wish we could just stop everything and give us six months to catch up. Uh, the casinos were a huge issue, so divisive for Philadelphia, and yet we had to deal with that too. I mean, there, there's probably few political issues that have racked the city recently than, than the casino issue. But we had to, we had to sort of um, say, it's a fact on the ground, it's a reality, we can't be positive or negative, we just have to accept it and you know, manage it the best way we can and build a process around it. Uh, you know, as soon as we took one side or the other, we would have been finished. Right? We'd have lost either credibility with the community or credibility with the administration. So, uh, yeah, there, I wish I had a great answer for you. If you come up with one, let us know. I mean, but, we'd love to. But I think it's also important what, what Harris was talking about as far as meeting design and process, right, when you've got emotional issues, is how do you design a meeting that's going to accommodate everybody's viewpoint without killing each other? So, and in Philadelphia, and you, we you, kill each other. Right. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so you need help, you know, and bring in an outside third, you know, a neutral party if you think you need it. You have to know the stakeholders, you need to know the people in the room to design a process that's appropriate for that. Well, I wanna thank all of our speakers and uh, thank all of you for coming and I especially wanna thank our sponsors uh, for today's program, the San Antonio River Authority, AIA San Antonio, Bear County. I know there are uh, board members and representatives from those organizations here this evening and uh, this is not uh, an opportunity to find a a program that we're gonna to follow to the letter that's gonna help us do this in San Antonio. It's an opportunity to start a discussion about where we wanna go and find the authentic process that works here in San Antonio and capitalizes on our resources the way their plan has capitalized on Philadelphia's resources. So thank you all for coming this evening and a big thank you to our, our panelists. Thank you.